We're back for another Ask GC Anything, where you get to ask us your cycling-related questions. Uh, don't forget, if you've got any questions that you would like to ask us ready for next week's show, leave them in the comment section just down below, or use the hashtag TalkBack on Twitter. Or you can even send us a direct message on Facebook, if you so wish, as well. Uh, this week's first question comes in from Giorgio Stellini. Uh, energy gels and bars are quite expensive for just fun spins if you're on a student budget. What normal foods are good for fueling on the bike? That is a very good question. Uh, the idea behind energy gels and bars is that they give you very quickly absorbable carbohydrates to help replenish or top up the glycogen stores that you'll be getting through when you're out exercising. So in terms of normal food, you want to find something that is pretty good at doing that same job. Bananas are a good example, as is dried fruit, although that is a bit awkward sometimes to store in your pockets. But the great thing is that it's actually reasonably cheap to make your own homemade energy bars if you so wish. So you want to have ingredients which are quickly absorbable, cook them beforehand, store them, which you can do for quite some time, cut them into nice small segments, and then you can wrap them up and take them out on your ride, put them in your pockets and eat them when you wish. Now, Sir Richardson a few years ago gave us his very own recipe for his Uber energy bars, which he was very proud of at the time and still is to this day. And if you want step-by-step -step instructions and a recipe on exactly what you need to do, you can watch this next video. Ready-made energy bars are fantastic fuel for cycling. But if you want to make your own, however, you could try this secret GCN recipe. Now, it's based around oats, which are fantastic fuel for cycling. That's why everyone seemingly uses them in their energy bars. Now, there are reasons for that, partly because they're a great source of slow-release carbohydrate. They've also got quite a high proportion of protein in there and fat as well. So it's a really good all-round source. Right, next up is this question from Arjen Kingma. Uh, quick question from the Netherlands. I'm thinking of going to the Alps this summer to cycle some coals. Hence, I would like to do some training for that. However, as I'm living in the flattest country, training uphill cycling isn't really an easy option. Instead, we do have lots of dikes and a lot of headwind. And I was wondering, is cycling into the winds for long distances a good replacement for hill training? Well, yes, it very much can be if you've got a long stretch of road with a big headwind. But there are a few other options as well. And handily, very recently, we did a video on this exact subject. And one of the things that we briefly mentioned in the video is something called an air hub. Now, I was listening to a podcast recently with two pro riders from Orica Scott, Mitch Docker and Luke Durbridge. And Durbridge has been using an air hub in training for the last couple of years. With great effect, he's been coming on leaps and bounds in some of the biggest races in the world. Now, I've also seen Michal Kwiatkowski use one in the past and Andre Greipel already this year. And what an air hub does is allows you to get extra resistance at the front wheel. So you can be putting out more power for the same speed. Now, most of us don't need any help whatsoever in going slower. But if you are really serious about training for climbs on flat roads, this could definitely be a consideration because it allows you to put out a lot of power whilst keeping the speed low, so it will be nice and safe. However, there are a number of other things that you can do to train for climbs when you've only got flat roads. So if you want some suggestions, check out this next video. One thing I wish I'd done though is better utilise some of the terrain next to my house. Because local to me, there's an abundance of fire roads and gravel roads like this one, which all link up. And that's perfect because there's no junctions and of course there's no traffic as well. Plus, you've got the extra resistance off-road, which perfectly mimics the kind of resistance and power that you're going to have to put out when you're on a longer climb. So it's easy to do 30 minute intervals or even longer than that. Rapid fire round now, and we'll start off with this one from Yee Dinosaur. Is there a weight difference if you attach equipment on the bike rather than carrying it yourself? For example, lights, tools, etc. Uh, well, no, there is no difference as far as I personally know. The only time when an equivalent weight can make a difference is if it becomes rotational weight, i.e. it's around the rim, and of course you won't be putting tools or lights there. So to me, it makes no difference at all. I do tend to prefer a saddlebag, even though it contravenes certain rules that you can find out there on the internet. I think it does a great job of keeping your inner tubes and your tire levers and sometimes your multi-tool in a nice neat package because I don't like having it all on my back pockets. Uh, next up from 
Daniel VD on Twitter. Why do people find they have a higher FTP on the open road as opposed to the indoor trainer? And can you mitigate this? That's a very interesting question. Uh, my understanding is that a lot of the losses that you experience on an indoor trainer versus the open road are down to heat buildup. So of course, when you're out on the open road, you've got lots of wind blowing in your face and also from the fact that you're going through the air at a certain speed, you'll have some cooling properties from the air as well. And on the indoor trainer, even with a fan in your face, it's quite hard to replicate this. So your body quickly starts to overheat and you don't, don't have the capabilities of putting out exactly the same power. There's also a difference in the inertia of many trainers. So the pedal stroke is ever so slightly different. Sometimes a bit like the difference between riding on a flat road versus riding on a climbs. Lots of people find it easier to put power out on the climbs than on the flat roads. And it's a similar case really with a trainer. So you can mitigate it by trying to keep yourself as cool as possible, having multiple fans and also making sure you're hydrated and also choosing your indoor trainer carefully. One that allows you to have a nice power delivery throughout the pedal stroke should help you to get as close as possible to your FTP and your power out on the open road. Uh, Alex Tipton, here is a quick one I've been musing over since I started cycling. What is the true purpose of a cycling cap? Well, I'm not entirely sure as to the answer of this question. I'm sure there's some historians out there that will tell you the true history of the cycling cap. I would imagine, though, that in its origins, it was there to try and keep some of the elements out of your eyes because riders didn't use helmets or indeed shades in those early times of cycling. So it would keep the rain out, possibly mud coming up from the wheel in front of you, and also some of the sun as well. And it tends to be now, when it's raining, that the pro riders still use them underneath their helmets because they do do an incredibly good job of keeping that rain and spray off your eyes. Uh, Lewis writes, do pro cyclists get back problems when they are older due to riding so low and air all the time? Well, Lewis, I wouldn't personally know just yet, obviously. Uh, I will ask Matt later on today. In all seriousness, seriousness though, I haven't heard of anyone with any major back problems post cycling, but you only have to look at cyclists off the bike and the way that they sit to see that they do have postural problems, and I am certainly one of those. So if you are dedicated enough, I urge you to do some core exercises to try and kind of straighten yourself up because you are hunched over for multiple hours per day as a pro cyclist, and it can wreak havoc on your back. So hopefully I will find the time to do that myself later on in life. Uh, next up, and finally for the rapid fire round from Tim's on Twitter, would you rather ride under the best weather conditions in the worst traffic or under the worst weather conditions but no traffic? Hashtag talkback. Wow, what a question. Um, I think I'm going to say the worst weather conditions with no traffic because although that's not much fun, I would say it's even less fun to be riding amongst loads and loads of cars and other motor vehicles. So yeah, that's what I'm going to go with. Actually, I'd be interested to know what everyone else's thoughts are on that question. Let us know your comments down below. Our penultimate question comes in from Sam Hellebreckers. If I only have budget for one bike, what type should I get? Aero, lightweight or endurance? Well, I would imagine there are a lot of people out there pondering this exact same question at the moment as they're about to purchase a new bike. So the first thing you want to do is analyze the terrain in which you're going to ride. Is it mainly flat where you are or is it mainly mountainous? Uh, if it's the former, an aero bike is probably the way to go. If it's the latter, a lightweight bike might be more suitable to you. Although you can get lightweight uh, aero bikes these days. Also, analyze the type of riding that you want to do. Do you want to go out and actually pin a number on your back and race? or just go really fast on local group rides. If that's the case, you want to go for an aero bike. If you just want to enjoy long jaunts out into the countryside and be as comfortable as possible, then you might well want to get an endurance type bike. Having these written down will allow you to make that kind of decision, but you should also look at your own personal flexibility because aero bikes do tend to be quite low at the front end and have quite aggressive geometry. Now, so I went into quite some detail a year or so ago about the differences between an aero bike, an endurance bike, and a lightweight bike, and you can find that video right behind me now. Firstly, what are the differences between them then? Well, let's start with an aero bike. Now, as well as designed to be aerodynamic, there are other things that set this apart from our benchmark lightweight bike. So, for example, to help make you more aerodynamic, as well as the actual bike itself, these tend to have the lowest front ends out there, meaning that if you've got the flexibility in your hamstrings and your glutes, then you'll be able to adopt a super aerodynamic position. Our last question this week comes in on Twitter from Matt Doak. Uh, he's training for his first century ride and wants to know if he should take any days off before the event. 
I would say never be afraid of having a day completely off the bike. It is very easy to become extremely concentrated and almost be afraid of not touching the bike for an entire day. But even the pros do that. And especially that is apt one week before the event because by that point you should have done all of the hard work and it's about tapering and freshening up before the day itself. So to give you a personal example, if I was doing a big one day race that I really wanted to go well at, I would tend to take the Friday off if it was an event on the Sunday and on the Saturday I'd go out for a nice steady ride with a couple of efforts to open my legs up so I didn't feel blocked on the day. So if your sedentary ride is on the Sunday don't be afraid of having the Friday off maybe even the Monday previous off as well and do some nice steadier rides in between and an opening up ride the day before the event. Uh, recently actually Matt and I talked through a preparation plan for the Marathon de les Dolomites which we are both doing later on this year. So that includes the schedule for training in the months leading up to it and also what you should be doing the week leading up to the event itself and you can find that right here. It is vitally important that you allow yourself enough rest in order for your body to make the necessary physiological adaptations. Because essentially when you're out training, you are breaking your muscles down. And it is during rest that your body repairs those muscles, which will hopefully make you fitter and faster. Don't get enough rest and what you risk is overtraining or even worse, getting ill. Now, if at any point during your training period you feel overly fatigued and your motivation is at a low ebb, like Dan's clearly is today, it's important that you take a day off. Listen to your body. And that's especially important if you're training around a full-time job, study, and a family. Well, that's it for another week here on Ask GC Anything. Don't forget to leave your questions down below or to put them onto social media. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, it is free to do so. You've just got to click on the globe, which you'll be able to find on, our, on the screen somewhere right now. Okay, two videos which might be relevant to some of the questions that we've had already. First up, in that corner down there, is a video we did at the very start of GCN with Matt Rabin, a chiropractor to the Cannondale Drapak squad, or Garmin Sharp as it was at the time. Uh, that is how to improve your lower back stability with a certain Dan Martin. Meanwhile, down here, we did an Ask the Pros. How much do they do on their rest days during the big three-week Grand Tours?